Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. And as an Easter egg, now you know where I get that prayer from, from Psalm 19, the last verse. So we, we just heard 10 verses, 10 verses from the Gospel of Mark. And actually, please turn with me there now, um, if you're using one of the Blue Bibles. This is page 845, Mark, chapter 9, page 845. Now, 10 verses, that that doesn't seem like much, does it? There are, after all, more than 31,100 verses in the Bible. But these these 10 verses in Mark chapter 9, verses 38 through 48, well, they contain a lot, don't they? There are actually three different and, and I might say, complex moments in these 10 verses. Verses. I mean, first, there, there's this strange episode where, where a disciple, John, he tells Jesus that they have caught someone casting out demons in your name, and, and that they demanded that this interloper stop. Now, it kind of feels like, like John the disciple, he wants a reward for this, right? I imagine John's hand up in the Sunday school class, Jesus, Jesus, guess what I saw Jimmy doing in the hallway? <laughs> But John, he he doesn't get any extra credit for this. Instead, Jesus tells John and all the disciples not to stop freelancers. And then, and then for reasons that are not immediately clear, Jesus moves on in Mark 9 from, from this sort of tolerance towards those that are using his name without authorization to some words that sound very harsh. In verse 42, we hear Jesus say, it would be better for those who cause little ones, who cause children to sin, to instead have a five-ton stone tied around their neck and to be tossed into the sea. And then, then in verses 43 through 48, Jesus moves on from, from drowning the corruptors of children to telling his followers to amputate hands and feet and pluck out eyes that cause them to sin rather than be thrown into hell. I think sometimes these last verses uh, will overpower all the others. There is something deeply uncomfortable in them this lopping off of hands and feet in, in the name of purity Even if Jesus is speaking in hyperbole, which he is, and even if his logic does check out, which it does. I mean, it would be better to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire, as Jesus says. But man, it doesn't feel very good to hear that trade spoken out loud, does it? But before we look closer at at any of these three moments that Jesus walks us through in Mark chapter 9, I I want us to to zoom out for a moment and and to ask a question. Are these three moments even connected to each other? Or or is this just a case where, where a gospel writer is stacking up a bunch of little memories of Jesus, things he said and that he did, well, kind of on top of each other in no particular order to make sure he gets them in his story? What do you think? I mean, first we have this, if you aren't against Jesus, you are for him. And then better a millstone be tied around your neck than to cause a little one to sin. And and finally, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Now on one hand, yes, I said that. These thoughts, they they don't have to be connected. Um, They do stand on their own well enough. One of the nice things about having four different accounts of Jesus's life is that we can see that little episodes like this do get moved around sometimes. 
sometimes in very significant ways. To give one example, in Matthew and Mark and Luke, uh, Jesus drives the money changers out of the temple during Holy Week, just before his crucifixion. We know that story. We talk about it in Holy Week every year. But in John, that same incident, well, it happens at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And the difference is there in the Bible, in black and white. And sometimes Christians have taken great pains to, to try to fix or align these sorts of differences in the Bible, usually by proposing that Jesus did the same thing twice or that he did it in different places. And we can do that. Jesus may well have tossed money, temple, money changers out of the temple twice. Maybe, maybe they came back after the first time. But I think it's easier to simply entertain the possibility that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not always as interested in chronology and telling a story from the beginning to the end like we would be. Now that said, um, I don't actually think these moments here in Mark 9 are, are randomly put together. There is a thought progression in them that, that we can see if we look closely. And it does start, it starts with this concrete situation in verse 38. There, there is this report from John the disciple that outsiders, people who are not followers of Jesus, at least formally, have recognized that Jesus' name has power, power over even demonic forces. And evidently one of them at least was using Jesus' name as, as, a, as a tool or a talisman in an exorcism, saying, by the power of Jesus, leave. And this, this clearly concerns the disciples. I mean, they are the authorized franchise holders of exorcisms in Jesus' name. I mean, Jesus does send them out to heal and exorcise with his authority in Mark chapter 6. It says there, and Jesus called the 12 and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. That's the power to drive out, to exorcise unclean spirits. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and, and suggest that exorcism probably seems foreign to most of us. But we still, we still, we still can understand where the disciples are coming from. I mean, it's never fun to be the authorized retailer and see your market flooded <laughs> with fakes using your company name. But you know, it seems that Jesus does not care about his intellectual property. He's not calling the lawyers to, to sue those and infringing on his product. Jesus actually tells his disciples, do not stop him, for, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will soon be able to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. The one who is not against us is for us. Now, why is Jesus like that? A couple of things come to mind to me. First, First is Jesus never shows much interest in, in accruing power for himself. He's not trying to build a downline for his multi-level marketing organization. Instead, instead he is inviting people into God's kingdom. And he's on board with anything. And, and we see, see here that would include the driving out of evil spirits in his name by someone who is not even a close follower. That points people, that points people in the direction of his kingdom. Now that's fine and good, but maybe you're wondering, how, how does that apply to us? Well, here's something to think about. We live in a world where there are all kinds of different ways of being Christian. Maybe you have noticed that. Many of these different ways of being Christian well, they disagree with each other about things large and small. Maybe you have noticed that. Now, don't get me wrong. We Anglicans are right about everything. <laughs> but maybe, maybe, instead of arguing about which Christian body really holds the franchise for Jesus Incorporated, we could instead 
practice off asking a very simple question. Are those other guys doing mighty works in Jesus' name? If so, just maybe we could say with Jesus, he who is not against us is for us. At the same time, at the same time, there, there is another side of the coin here that, that forms the connection to what Jesus says next about, about causing little ones to sin in millstones in verse 42. You see, while Jesus has a lot of tolerance for those who point people toward him and his teaching, because that points them to the kingdom of God, even if they're not authorized, he has a strong warning here toward, toward anyone who does the opposite. That is, who leads anyone away from him. He says, verse 42, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin. So somebody that's in a place of belief causes them to sin. It would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. So Jesus, he's entirely on board with outsiders pointing people into God's kingdom. But he has this terrible warning for insiders leading people out of God's kingdom. Better to be drowned in the sea, he says, than do that. So how does this apply to us today? Well, it just happens today is a baptism Sunday at Epiphany. And we are going to formally welcome a couple of little ones, literal little ones, into God's kingdom. And as we do that, all of us, well, we'll make some promises and take some vows. Parents and godparents will vow, among other things, to renounce the devil and all his works. And they will vow to raise these children as Christians in the church. And all of us, as the body of Christ in this place, well, we will promise to do all in our power to support these persons. And I take that to mean parents and children in their life in Christ. Friends, these are very, very weighty things we are promising to God this morning. Millstone weighty, even. Please only say them if you mean to keep them. And if you've said them in the past, maybe at some other church service for some other children or family members and have not kept them, repent. It is not too late. You see, while Jesus has great tolerance for outsiders leading people into God's kingdom, he tells us here in Mark 9 that he has very little tolerance for insiders leading people out. And this brings us to verse 43. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. In other words, it's not only about outsiders leading people in and insiders leading people out. It is about us as individuals following Jesus. It is about where we are leading ourselves. Jesus is saying very clearly here that, that if there is anything in us that leads us away from God and his kingdom, it would be best to cut it off. That is to do without it. And he uses the example of hands and feet and eyes to, to make it clear that this is painful and costly sometimes. But Jesus says it still may be necessary. And again, let's, let's move from the metaphor now to the concrete. How, how does this apply to us? Because, because Jesus doesn't really want us to amputate our limbs or pluck out our eyes. But that being the case, what does this look like? Friends, it looks like fleeing temptation. Fleeing temptation even when it feels costly, even when it feels impractical. Imagine, purely hypothetically, of course, that, 
that just maybe our smartphone causes us to sin in some way. Maybe by giving us access to certain websites, maybe enabling addictive behavior that is damaging us and our family. Now, that's not the only thing smartphones do, of course. You can also use it to use our app here at the church, just saying. <laughs> but in this moment, I'm, I'm thinking of things like the way our phones can enable other habits, maybe a pornography habit or a gambling addiction, maybe a relationship that really isn't healthy for us. Or, and this may be particularly important as elections approach here in America, by encouraging us to feast off the partisan rage machine that does its best to push us towards, towards fearing and even hating our neighbors rather than loving them as we're commanded by Jesus. So what can we do about that? And the device that we hold in our hands that sometimes for some of us makes those bad things possible. Well, we can resist temptation, right? We could give another family member or friend permission to check in with us about how we're using this device. But what if none of that is really working? What does Jesus say? Cut it off. We could consider doing something crazy, like replacing our smartphone with a dumb one. Friends, people have done much crazier things than that for the kingdom of heaven. And not only that, it's clear from Mark 9 that, that Jesus approves, not, not only approves, but encourages us to, to take the direction we are moving so seriously, either, either toward or away from God and his kingdom, that we are willing to make hard choices sometimes to stay on the right road. So, here in Mark 9, if you aren't against Jesus, you're for him. And better a millstone be tied around your neck than you lead people away from Jesus, particularly children. And finally, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. There are a lot of challenging things in this, this group of 10 little verses in Mark chapter 9. Is there something in here that maybe applies in your life or mine? Is there some area where maybe we are called to look for the mighty works in Jesus' name and care less about proper authorization? Is there a sobering call to take seriously the vows we will take this morning to lead little ones toward and not away from God's kingdom? Just might there be something in our lives that we really, really need to cut off. Consider praying about these things this week and then be brave and do what Jesus says. Amen.